Welcome, everybody. I'm Hannah Weisberg, host of Ordinary People with Extraordinary Stories, and I'm joined today with Hani Klein from Elat Israel. Hani, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me. A pleasure. So, Hani, you're in Elat right now, and Elat is a little bit, you know, geographically, it's it's the the south part of Israel. It's all the way in the south, and your situation has probably changed a lot in terms of even in terms of from a couple of weeks ago to now in terms of the war that's going on in Israel because you have a lot of different fronts that you're working with at the at this time. You were mentioning that there's a lot of refugees that are there in a lot. You want to tell us a little about that? Um sure. I think you mentioned things have changed in a lot. I think uh things have changed for every for all the Jewish people everywhere a lot. In the last right. two weeks, two and a half oh, weeks. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, horrific. I think everyone feels their Jewishness a little bit different now. What are you seeing? What are you seeing there? So in a lot, um, um, our situation is that um, we, at as the first few days after the horrors, as the horror started to unfold and we started, people started slowly, slowly understanding, or I don't think we can understand, but hearing and the trickles were coming in of just the magnitude of the, of what went on. At the same time, we started um, receiving people coming from the South. We're called the South, but when they say the South, they don't mean us. We're we're just we're off the map. Um, yeah. We're we're not in that South. We're a couple right. hours we're a couple hours south of there, south um, of the South. Okay. Yeah. Um, people started heading down towards us, and um, until the government formally relocated all the families from uh, the all the na- the families from the communities neighboring Aza were relocated um, to a lot, some to um, Yama Melech, the Dead Sea area, um, but the the main, uh, most of the families um, and communities were moved to a lot and each community was kept together as much as possible. Can, can you give us, can, can you give us a figure like about how many people you're talking about that were moved there? Like what's the difference yeah. in your, in your city? So the, we're talking about 60,000 um, dislocated. Wow relocated families, wow. dislocated, wow. Um, uh, here in a lot, which is about the number that that's double the size of our city, um, of the oh, population wow. of the city. Wow. So, um, the city is, so where are they all staying? How do they, how well, do they fit them all in? A lot is a tourist city. So it's a busy city all the time. There's the, um, the locals <laughs> and there's the tourist area. Um, so there, um, there are, hotels, lots of, ho- of hotels, lots of Airbnb, um, lots of people opening up their homes. Um, the ho- the beds in a lot, as far as the the hotel hotels are at 100% capacity. People are opening up their homes. Um, also in the neighboring communities and like the suburbs of a lot, Barora, um, Kibbutz Elot, the, the areas, um, the suburbs of a lot too. People are just opening up their homes. Um, and they know that they're opening it long term. There, we don't know. We know it won't be quick. Incredible. We know um, people are so. So people are just opening their homes to strangers coming. I mean, not strangers, but other Israelis that they don't know. These are brothers and sisters, but those that they don't know. Mm-hmm. Especially in the first days before everything was set up with, you know, the, I guess contracts with the hotels or knowing, you know, the hotels emptying out um, and clearing them for for the um the communities of the of uh, the Gaza border um and how does it work with the hotels do they keep, do they try to keep them together how, do, how does uh... so each um each kibbutz or uh, moshav or little city is um is moved together into a hotel or if they're bigger than a few hotels and they have all their um services there. Um, first of all, the kibbutzim are very well organized and they're small enough to, you know, they have their own social hierarchy and their own um, people in charge of different parts and different areas of the kibbutz. So they have it going on in their newly relocated communities in um, in the hotels. 
um, the psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers and those type of people are coming down, people from the state tell, helping take care of legal and financial things coming and, you know, literally each hotel lobby looks kind of like a, a fair, you know, you have tables with each of the, the things and services that are needed, plus the areas where there's food distribution and what's going on now is, I mean, the, there were, there were planning for the short long term. Um, and so the schools have set up for this, the schools in a lot, um, they are run for the a lot children from eight to 12, some of them eight to one. And then in the afternoon, um, each school building is allotted to whatever a, a community, a kibbutz and all those children stay together and come to the school building. They have their school building with their principals and their teachers, which is probably the most healthy and best thing to do for them is to have them stay with those people that they're familiar with, try to mourn together, heal together, find new. Wow. Um, wow. So they, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just imagining like people coming with just the, the clothes on their back. That's basically what the people are coming with. And they just need to find a new home in with nothing, with all the past that they had just wiped out basically clothes on their back or I mean, literally in pajamas or torn clothes or without oh shoes. Gosh. Wow. Um, coming as is, um, there are some wow. places where the residents had time to maybe gather some things, but mainly not, um, coming and people who would usually are not used to taking, not used to having to just rely on other people in such a huge way. And they just need to, be the recipients of just everyone's kindness and ever, and there is, I mean, everyone understands that this is the call of the hour. Everyone wants to give all of Israel is just coming and giving and giving to the soldiers and to the residents. Um, there's nothing that we could do to take anything away and to make it any easier. But if we could just show that if they just know that we want to do anything we can to soften it, um, that's, they're, we're seeing that from the, the entire Israel together um, is showing it to them in every way, trying. I mean, it's it's not, I, again, I mean, we're, the, the, these communities are still, people are, there's still lots of funerals going on day by day, funeral after funeral what, after what, funeral. Wow. What, what does it look like from your, from your Chabad house? How are you, what's, what's the situation? What are you trying to do? Um, <laughs> We're trying to be I mean, dynamic. I mean, we're talking about such it's, a mag magnitude yeah. of a situation, like it's so huge and horrific. How can someone help? What can someone do? So it's, we're trying to do anything, everything that comes our way. Um, and obviously also going out of our way to find what needs, what, what the needs are. But, um, um, and it's, and, the frenzy has changed over time a bit. You know, in the beginning, it was just everything from bases and commanders calling us just, you know, Harav Mendy, we need, we need wipes. I mean, they needed basic supplies. They were having so many um, reservists coming up. They had, I mean, people, every, all the soldiers were coming with nothing as they were on the holiday being called up and having the reservists come. And usually, you know, in our area, there's, 10,000 soldiers, I might have the numbers wrong, 30,000 soldiers. And now the number grew to 50 to 100,000 soldiers. That's like, <laughs> the needs are huge. Yeah, so at first it was just even, I mean, it's funny. You, you'd imagine, you know, 11 o'clock at night, we get a, a phone call from a commander. There was someone here um, visiting who was helping to distribute tzitzis. And she couldn't believe it. She's like, that's the mefaked, that's the commander. Hi, <laughs> we need, can you get a hold for us? Can you get a hold of, we need... Um, what do you call it? Portable chargers. Oh, wow. There's a shortage all wow. over Israel because every family also, I mean, after, especially families, you know, who are holed up for 12, 24, 48 hours in, in their safe rooms with carnage around them, you know, everyone now knows the need, plus the soldiers need it um, in the field and in the war. So, you know, things like that. Can you help us get a hold of it, <laughs> of that? Um, so things from that to Arab Mendi, Talitot, we need we need talisim, we need talises, prayer shawls for for the bases. We need um, uh, so many of the residents. It's interesting because they're not in homes. They're asking for mezuzahs. You know, 
mezuzahs, they really. Have, they, they don't have mezuzahs. Um, or they, or they want a mezuzah because it's a, another a thing of safekeeping. So, if, you know, you're supposed to check your mezuzahs. So at least to have a mezuzah with them. Um, um, there's been, you know, at, there's clothing drives and, and people giving old clothing, new clothing organizations. Now, as time goes on, it's become more organized and there's huge organizations taking care of it. So our, me personally, my husband always is busy and doing the craziest amount of things and and I I, I can't even reviewing his day with him at the end of the day right. is just it's unbelievable it, it, no one would believe it but um, for me the frenzy actually became scary it became overwhelming and 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 I was also feeling so um, very feeling awful that I was having a hard time, you know, I'm trying to deal with, you know, a war going on and those fears. And, you know, I really believe in, um, I think we all do as Hasidim. And I think we all know it now that just your thoughts are very powerful, you know, and it's the holiday, it's uh, uh, Shabbos, it's Simchas Tara, keeping those good thoughts, keeping everything that's going on out, keeping the holiday and having the holiday joy. It, that's, that's where we need to stay keep all other thoughts out and also all the fears out, even as the week goes on, helping people, having my house full of all different situations and people, you know, someone that would get, get stranded for America, our flight wouldn't go, couldn't go back. We had boys that were here, um, a group of 10 um, young men that were here helping us the whole holiday season, the whole month of um, Tishrei. And then they end up staying here in a lot for another 10 days. Um, so we, we've, we, so many of so much of that going on. And we're back to almost like Corona times. The kids are all home. Nobody's in school. There's a very, when will we, right. you don't go out of the house, you stay in the house all day. Um, a lot of that. So I was, because, and the need and the being so overwhelmed by the thoughts of all, so many people coming so many funerals happening, so much tragedy around us. I, I don't, I'm not unique in this. I'm sure everyone in Israel, out of Israel. Um, and I'm going through my daily, my regular day things, cleaning my, taking care of my kids, going, getting a little overwhelmed by guests and people and getting things to people that they need and, and feeling really guilty. I'm, I'm overwhelmed by what? I have a home, thank God. I have my children. We weren't, we weren't, we weren't ourselves. Didn't weren't targeted. We weren't, our homes weren't entered. I didn't have to run away from any sirens. Feeling extremely, extremely, just being hard on myself that 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 I was being hu human, that I had human wow. needs and and overwhelmness when what. Who am I in this? Nothing. I, I I didn't. I mean, we had guests. Or we had guests for the Shabbat meal from Sterot, um, a family that. Let's see. This this it happened on a shot on a Shabbos Shabbat. The the war began, and by Tuesday, they were in the Elat area. They're staying at somebody's home. And they were just saying, you know, how wonderful they're being taken care of in this family. And they were coming to us for the uh, Shabbat dinner. And um, they were sitting, we were chit-chatting before the meal. And just, I felt like I had nothing. I, I was overwhelmed by it and, and letting them know by what they've been through. And, you know, and how sorry I am and how grateful I am that. And and somehow it came up a bit about this um this guilt, like, you know, how could things be difficult? How could we, and, you know, and look what you've been through. And, and you guys were with terrorists in your, in your around, surroundings. And they're talking about how they were in their safe room for eight hours, locked in and holding the door. And they're looking out their security camera and they see the terrorists. They had the, one of the girls is explaining how she heard them knocking on her door. And then when I said something to the fact of I mean, what you've been through, you guys were like, and I, you know, and I'm like, oh no, oh no, we weren't, we didn't experience anything. I mean, we were we were in our safe room and we were fine. In our city, only only five houses were entered by terrorists. The you know, the kibbutzim or the other the other areas. I mean, they had every single house entered. So, hmm. they, I, I mean, just 
So they're feeling, no, we, we didn't experience it or, or they're feeling kind of that guilt of survive. I'm calling, I'm, I'm just realizing I'm calling it survivor's guilt because, you know, sure. um, going through your day to day and, you know, try to be grateful, but, but we're humans and things get hard and things get overwhelming. So I had to find a place of, um, coming, coming, coming to peace with that. And, um, that did help when I, when I was able to find, um, that we are, we're all survivors and we're supposed to survive and not survive. We're supposed to thrive and, 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 and our, our, we're supposed to shine through this and, um, and help mm-hmm. others. And through that, through that light that we each have, um, and we allow ourselves without the guilt, we allow ourselves to have that light, have the joy, um, have some frustrations. Right. Sure. Um, and, and then, and then you could spread that to somebody else. I, I think you're touching on a big point. Cause I think a lot of people here in America are just feeling like, I remember a friend of mine was saying to me, like, am I even allowed to pray for something for myself or my family right now? Like, how can I even be thinking about myself and my own needs when look at what's going on in Israel and I should be doing, you know, just going about our day to day lives, you know, purchasing things or doing things. We feel guilty. So, you know, how, how do you think we should look at it? How should we look at the situation? Um, I, I'm going to say from a few perspectives, first of all, from a Jewish perspective, life, there's nothing greater than life. We need to stay alive and joyful. Um, joy breaks all barriers. Simchat Boretz Geder. And this war, this atrocity occurred on the holiday of joy. And we need to remember not to let that joy be broken. There you know, I don't think they knew the power we have the day that they chose. The power of that day is the day of our joy. And we will take that joy and they can't break it. And we need to live our life with simcha, with joy, with happiness. And and I don't think the people who went, who experienced the, the, the horrors so close up want everyone's lives to stop, God forbid. On the contrary, we now know the so much more the what life is. Mm. What and especially when you contrast it, God forbid, with, with evil. Mm. And we know what joy and life is and we and we need to do that. We need we, we are good at that. We need to do it with so much more life and with so much more joy because it adds. We are adding to each other. It's not Oh, I'm in America and they're there and I can't do anything. And you could do a lot. I, I, me too, here in a lot. You know, no, I can't. I'm not sitting and serving 60,000 families a meal that I cooked every day. I'm, I'm not. It's impossible but for I, any human being. But right. it becomes overwhelming because it, you, you think like, oh, there's 60,000 people. It almost feels like, should I even start with one if I can't do all? Exactly. It becomes extremely overwhelming. It took me till after the first Shabbat, um, which was also a busy time, but something about Shabbat was, um, it just brought me back down. It, it, centered. On the, center, it was very centering. Um, being, you know, the, the, being off the phone, um, not not be connected to the news and to other people in that way, but just real people in front of you. Um, and just having just something special. This, the Shabbat did it also just Shabbat. It gives you that, that strength and that peace. Um, I would, I, I realized that I don't need to be in a frenzy. There's 60,000 people here who need help who have gone through such tragedy and they each need such heart and such things that I can't, give them back, but I can, you know, hopefully give them, but, but I, I'm not going to stand say face to face to 60,000. So I realized I need to do what I can do for every single one that I can reach and what I'm best at. I, you know, there's all different organizations that are, are they're in hotels, which the food is taken care of. Not for everyone. We had people call up today and we ran, you know, ran to the Bet Chabad and made sure that they had meals. Um, for whatever reason, there's all different reasons why 
certain things are still not taken care of for different people. Clothing, you know, so they have they have clothing for a few days and now they need more and more and they need to be able to do shopping on their own so they could choose their own clothing, not just donations. But there's big organizations and truckloads of things coming through. It's never enough. Everyone is missing everything and people who are able to do in that way can. But I realized they don't need me for that and and, and I can't even do it. They've got, there, there's organizations going on, but what I can do is what I'm good at and, and what, and what I could do to touch people. So for example, people just need some, there's children, they just need like a home feeling and some sort of consistency in their schedule. Come be by me from a few hours every day. We'll have that consistent schedule, a warm meal, some, you know, a group time with some singing, go play games, some calm time, you know, living in hotels. I think we all know from, you know, people who go on vacation, being with kids in a hotel. Not, it's not easy, easy. Sure. It's not easy. Come spread around, around the house, have your quiet time when I'm very, very lucky. The schools in Eilat opened pretty quickly. Most of Israel, much of Israel still has schools closed. Parents in Israel are struggling even if they weren't through because. directly um, hit just by that, that, that the war is going on and people are home all day with fears and with children and trying to entertain people. Families limping just because so many people were called up. So many people are volunteering. I mean, so many homes are without their father or a brother and sons because they're, they're out on the fronts, on the front lines. Besides, unfortunately the amount that were murdered and right. and and taken hostage um so when i was able to come to that place of i will i i will give what i can give best and if i'm going to try to give it to 60,000 no one will get any good from me <laughs> uh -huh. mm. but if i give it to the 1 and the 2 and the 3 and the 5 and the 10 that i can and then I can help those 10 people. Um, God willing, that will give them a little strength to help other people that come their way or their own family, their own little circle. And then also um, we're trying to do whatever we can for those who turn to us mm -hmm. um, in any way, the weddings, bar mitzvahs, food, <laughs> a grandfather that called up the other day and asked if, from out of a lot, and asked, called us, they've looked for the Bet Chabad and Ela and asked us to, um, if we could get a knitted kippah to their grandson who's serving, who's um, in a, on an army base in Shizafon. Wow. Um, it's an hour and a half away from us and we were going to the bases. We go to them regularly. Um, we've been giving out to fill in that communities and individuals in the United States donated because there's such a, um, so many soldiers have now wanted to begin putting on tefillin and there's been a huge um need for tefillin and communities and individuals and in the states um donated and sent them in and we've been going to bases and giving them to soldiers who have committed to putting them on regularly and didn't have never got by their bar mitzvah or for whatever reason never got to fill it had to fill in so we've been going to the bases and um and so you, know, you brought this knitted, knitted yarmulke to knitted that, yarmulke, to that. Knitted yarmulke. and then on, we were already out of the city and the mother called up and said, I heard my father, the grandfather called you to get a kippah for my son. Can you also please bring him a pillow? He told me he needs a pillow. Wow. <laughs> right. It's just those little small things, you know, and there's another 3000 soldiers on that base. Right. So do I feel bad for the other 3000 we couldn't get a personal pillow for? We could get another few, but I, I just won't be able to provide everything for everyone. There's communities in the States who are turning to us. They've heard that we're here. How can we help? What can we do? They want to directly, I, I, I see people, and I understand it. People want to have a, feel the direct um, connection and the direct help. Um, so people want to know and know like have the direct connection with um, whoever they're helping. So we're, we have been able to somewhat um, connect or um, make a shidduch. Right, between, make a match. Make a match right. between people who want to give something and 
an individual who has a certain need or bases that have certain needs or, um, but sometimes it's big. I was speaking to someone yesterday, uh, last night, um, someone I don't know who just contacted me and he said, you know, I'm a philanthropist and I have a group of friends of mine, philanthropists, and we've raised a certain amount of money and we want to be in direct contact. We want to not, we want to give it directly to, um, refugees. I, I, I don't like calling them refugees, um, hmm. displaced people. I don't know people who have lost everything, hmm. everything. Um, and we want to help them. And, and I had to kind of take him a little bit through my dilemma, my own personal dilemma to explain to him how it's not easy to actually, um, and we had to come up with, we, we had to brainstorm a little bit. How can, how can we do this? There are 60,000 60, people here, over 10,000 families. So we have a hotel. Do you want to adopt three, four, five families and mm. give all of them all their needs? And they're in a hotel with another 80 families from their kibbutz. Um, right. like, and then he was like, well, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> like, how are we going to do this? You know, can we, you know, we got PlayStations for kids. So they did that already. They did things on their own. They were just trying to connect with individual people. But he was saying when he was connecting with individual people, the needs are huge to all right. families. To Anyway, he came, we came up with some sort of idea. Maybe every bar and bat mitzvah boy that has a bar and bat mitzvah, they would prepare. This community would prepare mm -hmm. a special gift, um, you know, really pampering gifts with spiritual and um, material things. Mm -hmm. in it. But, but what I'm saying is it's, it's overwhelming. You kind of have to just find, yes, the individuals, but also the thing that you can do. Um, to give, to give, I, I guess not being overwhelmed by the numbers, but just looking at each individual and realizing that every individual is a whole world on their own and whatever you can do to help that individual, you've helped a whole world. Absolutely. If we saw, um, unfortunately or go through the tragedy, how each individual, I mean, each individual loss is a huge loss. It's a whole family. It's a whole, a father, a, a a whole world, each person that was murdered. Right. And so why wouldn't it be that same way for giving? If I'm helping one person with one, make something a little easier for them or one little help take care of one little thing for them that I can, why, why would we suddenly be down on ourselves that that's, that's not good and that's not okay. I need to. Right. Right. That's true. Um, when you go to the bases, the army bases, what do you find the mood is, 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 I mean, you travel there a lot and you're giving a lot of supplies and a lot of things there. What is the mood there? The mood is, is amazing. It's, it's very uplifting. It actually, I didn't realize how lucky I am that we've been um, going to the bases almost from day one. We are always at the base. It, we, it, this isn't new for us, you know, being at the army bases. But I didn't realize how lucky I was until, you know, it took me in, until probably after Shabbos when I started being able to just call people um, and check on them in the in the Merkaz, central Israel. And when I'm talking to them on the phone, how are you? Oh, you know, oh, just the mood was so um, down. down. And we all experience, and I understand that. And it's, it's completely understandable, but I realized my mood was up. And I realized two things. And I, I spoke with this with... Um, this family member who I was speaking with. And she said, thank you. This is so, you're so right. Two things. We were, we had to get out of our fear and get out of the house. And we're, we weren't just out of the house. We were out of the house with our kids running around, going to stores, getting supplies, filling our carts, filling our cars, running, running to bases. Like we were just suddenly, you know, that all that fear of, you know, keep our doors locked and who knows, you know, no, there was a lot of uncertainty. What, what's going on for, quite a while. Um, and in some ways you could still be in that fear and rightfully. Um, right. Um, but just being out and about and having, and, and, and getting out there, it just made us really busy and feeling very positive and, and there's a mission we've got to do stuff. Mm -hmm. And when we got to the bases, the energy and the spirit and the tenacity, like, and, and, and no doubt we are, we're ready to go in and without any doubts, we're going to do this and we're going to take care of it. It, it. it was just so powerful. The, the soldiers, the, the bases are full of energy. It's not just bases. It's like outposts we, um, because all the reservists there, the bases aren't outfitted for this amount of people. 
a lot usually uh, they aren't outfitted for you know anything near this so i think what sure. was it they called up 300,000 reservists wow that's so they're they're sleeping out on the gr- outside on you know on in outposts and, and practicing all day and so but the energy is just it and it gives us a lot of strength but we're also giving them a lot of strength when you see in the news all over israel how people are going out and just going and making meals for the soldiers and bringing and bringing. And, and, you know, there's the joke, the soldiers are like, Oh, well, you know, can we have, can, you know, just like asking for the silliest things because they'll just ask for anything. And, you know, they're getting all these surprises, but, but it, it gives the, it gives the strength that they need. The entire nation is behind you in, in unity behind you, the entire mm-hmm. world, the, the, the world Jewish community is behind you and they're feeling it. And that's part of what it's, it's a back and forth. They're feeling that, that support and it gives them that that power and when you see them so powerful and in such having fun and and just with a real real amazing spirit it gives it back to us so wow. i think we we definitely are giving the power and getting it from them and i think this is what very much what the rebbe the rebbe this is what the rebbe taught us and 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 in every in every type of situation that Israel had like this, this is what the Rebbe taught us. We give power to them. We give power. We literally can affect that the strength of the IDF, the strength and the outcomes of the war by the things we do, by our joy, mm-hmm. by our simcha. I'm saying that because this was simcha styra. And by our lighting a candle, putting on tefillin, checking the mezuzahs, putting up a kosher mezuzah on the door, taking on whatever it is, another another chapter of Psalms, an, an extra prayer in the morning. I had, There was a woman staying here who knows my family for a long time. She was meant to be in Israel for a spiritual um, uplifting holiday season for three weeks. And she was coming for the tail end of her trip for one and a half days to Eilat for Simchat Torah. And she ended up being here for two weeks. And um, and she retook up for, for this, she retook upon herself, making sure to say Mode'ani in the morning and mm-hmm. washing her hands every morning. There's nothing too small. Everything, everything is wow. it's huge. And we, we don't know. We don't know the effects of it. Um, and, and I think the fact that it happened on Simchas Torah, I mean, you wanted to share something about that because of the unity as well, right? Yes, I, um, Simchas Torah in the morning, um, we, we had a, a family member staying here and he was in synagogue and they were starting to be whispering and people coming in with some news, you know something's going on. There's been, you know, when you say an attack, they think like a terrorist attack, you know, okay. But he came home. He's in, he's in intelligence. He's a reservist in intelligence. He's already uh, not, uh, you know, on his regular army duty to finish his three years. Um, And sure enough, he was in his room and he saw his phone flashing. He normally wouldn't have answered it, but he saw that it said on it, it was his um, reserve officer. Mm -hmm. And he answered it. He had to answer it. And he was called up and she said to him, Yom Kippur Shtayim, Yom Kippur mm. War number two. Hmm. And his base had been infiltrated. I mean, the things, it's thing, things that are unthinkable. You can't fathom, to go from, you know, Simchas Torah to these un- unfathomable things. So we're, you know, 1030 in the morning on Simchas Torah, half the family's in shul at synagogue. And I'm at home with, with the young children and hearing this news and lock it, you know, lock the doors and keep and and also just trying to be like it's in Torah. We're keeping the joy. We're keeping this out of here. We have our job to do hmm. to, to keep to keep some Torah and to keep that un, 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 unadulterated. Um, but on hmm. the other hand, I'm I'm human, and some of that was getting in, and I'm trying to and I'm trying to like, good thoughts. And um, my neighbor came to the door. There was a knock on the door and the kids always, our doors are always open. <laughs> and the kids for sure, they ran to the door and I said, ask who it is, ask who it is first. 
And I'm like yelling, and they didn't know why I'm saying this. They had, they didn't hear, right. me. they didn't know anything. I said, "Ask who it is, ask who." I'm like yelling like panic, and they're, like, "Who is it?" And I'm running to the door too, and it's the neighbor, you know. Mm-hmm. And she comes in. And I said, "You know, we're chit chatting." I said, "Have you heard anything?" He's like, "Oh yeah, I heard a little bit. Something. My husband said something, and you know, in synagogue, something." Anyway, I said, "Yeah, there, it's been apparently it's it's quite it's quite big." I said, "Let's sit down. We we learn every Shabbat together. We we." Try to learn. Um, she very much um, enjoys learning Hasidut. And um, we opened up to something, um, a talk of the Rebbe um, from Simchat Torah. And I just couldn't believe it. It was just, I changed immediately. I I, I felt it inside. I, it gave me everything I needed. And from there, it's been, it's kind of been what what I've been living with and make everyone who comes to this house has to, has been, has been living with this because it's at every Shabbos when we talk about this and um, wherever, kind of wherever we go. But um, uh, the, the holiday of Shemini Atzeres. What did it say? So, so this is what I'm going to just give it really concisely. The holiday of, what is this holiday of Shemini Atzeres the eighth, and Simchas Torah? It's there's the seven days of Sukkot, and then we have another two days, Shemini Atzeres, the eighth day, and then and then Simchat Torah. So in Israel, it's it's one day combined together. Um, uh, so what's this eighth day? Well, it's God is say, says to is saying to the Jewish people, um, uh, please stay one more, stay together one more day. Um, it's hard. It, the Kasha Alai Predatchem, departing. You know, separating is very difficult for me. Um, it, you know, and the Rebbe asks a question, what is this? It's just pushing off the inevitable. The next day, this is going to happen. So what, what, what is this adding to, to being together, the togetherness with Hashem, if, if the next day the separation will happen anyway? Right. And, and the explanation is, is that, um, the, te- the unity of Sukkot, and Sukkot is a holiday of unity. It says that, mm-hmm. all of Israel is worthy of sitting under one sukkah. Um, all of Israel, all types can be under one sukkah, and in and if technical um, circumstances allow, can all be in one sukkah, and it's a kosher sukkah, and everyone completed the sukkah kosher. They don't each need their own separate sukkah. Um, and we experienced this, by the way, on this sukkot. We had 100 people in the sukkah, and it was from all the sectors of the Jewish of the Jewish world it, and it was just amazing beautiful unity and um and that and it's the sukkah that unifies us and what god is saying for shmini atzeret is stay one more day because as soon as the sukkah is gone that unifying item hmm. we don't have what's giving us that unity together but as long as we keep to that unity the next day on shmini atzeret because of our unity, just because of our unity with each other and with God, that and it's not the sukkah that's keeping us unified, then that unity has everlasting effects. It could stay even when the sukkah is not there. Then it will have its effect on the whole year. Mm-hmm. And when terrorists attacked on this Shemini Atzeret and Simchat Torah, and by the way, that unity isn't just a unity. It's a very physical and a unity in a way of not how each Jew is on their own level, how the Jews are all internally very, very unified. We dance with the Torah, not how, not with an open Torah and study the Torah when we find, finish the Torah. We dance with the Torah as it's closed. We use our own feet to dance with the Torah, not on each one, how they study the Torah, the open Torah on their different levels, the scholar and the simple man. No, we're all dancing with the Torah not as how well we can, you know, what knowledge we have of the Torah or how well we can learn the Torah. We're dancing with the Torah all as Jews using our own feet to carry the Torah as equals. And so this unity is is to very deep levels. And, it, and Simcha's Torah is the holiday that gives the Jewish people the strength of the unity for, throughout the whole year. And the whole year. Wow. Like, the terrorists were looking for a date, just like Haman, Amalek, my Purim, was drawing poor, Purim. He was drawing um, lots when to, for a date to choose to annihilate the mm-hmm. Jewish people. And he chose the month of Adar and he said, oh, that's a good month. Um, 
Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, the leader of Israel, he he passed away in that month. That's a great month. Mm, right. You no, know, wow. Moshe Rabbeinu was also born then. And I feel like my that what overcame me was they were choosing a date, but they had no idea. They chose the wrong date. This is the right. date that gives the of unity of the B'nai Israel, of the Jewish people. And it's the date that gives the Jewish people the strength to keep that unity throughout the whole year. And if we've seen one thing throughout all this is the unity. The unity, tremendous unity. Um, Everything else has gone aside. We are just there for each other. For each other. You, you also shared a beautiful thing about the communities of Gaza, the kibbutzim of Gaza that were hit um, with the, the terrible massacres. You, you were sharing how these, well, I'll let you say it in your own words, you know, how your perspective totally changed after this whole terrible tragedy. So I personally, I'm sure there are people that were aware. I personally was not aware how, how much we were being, these communities were protecting the entire Jewish people and the entire land of Israel. And when we talk about unity, with their very bodies, with their very yeah. city, living there, right? Their yeah. own when homes. We talk about their... it, unity. It's easy to think, oh, people need to be more accepting, and you know, perhaps accept, you know, not to be so rough on you know religious observance. You know what? These communities, these kibbutzim, weren't necessarily. You didn't see on the outside a lot of the a lot of you know. I'm hearing a lot from the people of the kibbutzim now. They say, I'm not. I'm not a religious person. I, I'm not a believer. I, I don't keep anything. I'm, I'm not at all religious. I don't believe in God. And these communities, kibbutz after kibbutz and moshav after moshav, are, have been doing self-sacrifice for so many years, day in, day out, night and day, with their bodies, protecting. Whether they realized it or not. Right? Every single one of us. I think they did realize it, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, and we didn't. Protecting the nation of Israel, the land of Israel, doing the mitzvah of Yeshuva Arts, settling the land with their entire being, just mm -hmm. waking up in the morning, breathing, eating, sleeping, living their lives over there on those borders is what was keeping, letting us live in Yerushalayim, in Eilat, in Tel Aviv, Without these, without all these, all the, the Jewish people that are sitting on the border, right. sitting on Gaza, and knowing that they are a meter into their backyard, hmm. really? there are those Incredible. who want to annihilate them. They've been, they've, they've saved our lot, my life. They've saved all of our lives, and they've sacrificed. And now. It's come to the point where, unfortunately, they've sacrificed their lives, literally, Messias Nefesh, in self-sacrifice. Unfortunately, it had to come to literal self-sacrifice for them to right. give themselves up for, for the Jewish people. And wow. 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 Incredible. You, you also shared how a lot of... Um, a lot of feeling about their Judaism has come, in, out, come out so so clearly. You shared a beautiful story with Shema Yisrael. Can you share it with us? Um, yes. There, um, I actually know four individual stories. I'm sure there are many more of what I call them Shema, Shema Yisrael stories. Um, there was um, there, were, there was an individual, a family whose home was entered um, by Hamas. They were hiding in their safe room, I, not to go to lengths with how they were saved, but when after 18 hours, um, when the idea finally came and they hear shouting outside their safe room, their house is burnt down, but their safe room, which is made out of concrete, they're in it and they hear Tzahal, 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 which means IDF, but they didn't know if they should believe it or not. And um, and they're banging on the steel door. Tal, tal, you know, we came to help you. We came to take you out. And the man on the other side of the door, he was one of the founders of the kibbutz, an older, you know, not old gentleman, but older a little bit. Middle-aged. And more than that. <laughs> but um, he said, I'm going to say a sentence and you complete mm -hmm. my sentence. And the soldier on the other side said, what's the sentence? 
And he said, Shema Yisrael. And the soldier on the other side oh. said, Adoshem Elokeinu, Adoshem Echad. And the man said, and then I, I opened the door. And he knew that he would be safe. And, and he knew he was a brother. He knew at this time of, I need to know if this is one of ours. Wow. He knew to, to reach down deep into his neshama that the Shema is... Is who we are. It's to who we are. And there was another story of another soldier who was in an elite unit and the atrocities that happened in his house, the amount of um, terrorists he, he killed, he had to kill coming into his house on his own. He's on a very elite unit and they were after him. They wanted him alive. They knew his address when they came. They had the most elite of the terrorists over there and they did not su succeed in taking him, not in killing him and not in capturing him. Um, and, um, when the terrorists finally set, were setting the house on fire, he was able to get into his safe room where he had already put his family, um, and he joined his wife and his daughter and, um, they just, and the house was on fire and the smoke was coming under the door and they decided that they, they would stay as long as they can until they had no choice and had to open the window. And by the way, there are so, I heard from so many women, this, this, what happened, this, this problem is that even if they stayed for so long in their safe room, when they finally burnt down their homes, they had to make the choice. They were breathing in suit or opening the window and, and then, and then they were entrapped. They were waiting for them outside the window, um, of the safe room. And, um, when they finally opened the window, it was quiet out and, uh, a military, one of the branches of the military was coming by. I, f I forgot what it's called. I think Sahar. He, this man, this man explained it, and he knows them all because he's part of a very special unit. And they said Sahar, and and he, his wife jumped out of the window, you know, kind of barely making it. They were barely breathing, and his daughter. And then he gets up on the on on the window. He's got his pistol or whatever it was. I don't know what rifle, dude, what type of gun. Weapon. And and right. he's bloodied. He's very wounded. And um, and he suddenly has four lasers on him from the group that from the group that's coming to take to rescue them, and he realizes they think he's a terrorist, and he's like, hmm. what could he? He was just, and then he said he just had a flash, like kind of a flash of inspiration, and he shouted out, "Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad," and they they paused a moment, and they weren't sure they were actually still afraid that he was a terrorist. Um, they were even afraid that the terrorists would use this. I guess they knew mm -hmm. how deep it was in the, in the, in the nation of Israel. Um, and in the end, his wife, they asked the wife who was on the ground, they said, who is that? And she said, it's my husband. They said, what's his name? And she said, Yaniv. And then they put their, they, mm -hmm. they laid their guns and then wow. they helped him out. Um, Incredible. Yeah. It, and there are a lot of stories like this. And you see the depth of it. it... Yeah. Wow. Honey, you're doing amazing things there. I, I just want you to end with any message that you have for all of us, for the rest of us here. Um, I, I just want to end with, you know, I, I'm not, I, I mean, it might look like I'm doing amazing things. I am where I am. So I'm doing what I can do here. There are, families, there are shluchais um, all over Israel who are in much more difficult situations, running to safe rooms or living in safe rooms these year, these days, dealing with traumas of hearing the sirens all the time, having their children still home all the time. Obviously, people dealing with tragedy and loss and all of our hostages and um and then people far away wanting to do something. I'm not doing something amazing. I'm here where I am living my life and using that and trying to um, bring meaning to that and help in the little ways that I can, in the little ways that I know to bring more spirituality, to bring more heart, to bring more of my own self to someone else so that they just to try to help in any little bit w way that I can but everyone's doing that where they can and everyone that's all anyone needs to do because if everyone's going to do that, we'll be in a very, very good place. We are in a good place because you see everyone coming out and just wanting to give and, and bring their heart to the table and say, I'm part of this. 
this is me, this is us. It's not, it's not just them on the Gaza border or those living in Israel. It's all of us right now. And we're in this together and, and, and that's why we'll be okay. It's all of us. Right. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you so much, honey, for joining us. Thank you for so much for sharing what's going on there in your part of the world. And thank you for sharing your heart with us and how you are giving of your heart to others and helping us to also open our hearts to do the little bit that we each can do to make the situation better. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. If you enjoyed uh, watching this interview, please subscribe to Ordinary People with Extraordinary S Stories. Uh, you can find our page on Chabad.org, on Chabad.org forward slash extraordinary. Make sure you are subscribed to our page and make sure, please, that you share a comment to let us know how you enjoyed this video or any of the other interviews to give us some feedback on what you felt about it. We really love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining.